This video is brought to you by me and my friends at Nebula. If China were to invade Taiwan, they would have advantages. Taiwan's defense spending, even at breakneck pace, is less than 5% of China's. And China's People's Liberation Army outnumbers Taiwan's military 12 to 1, a ratio that is worsening for Taiwan over time. And yet it's not at all clear that a Chinese invasion would be immediately successful. Taiwan has developed asymmetrical defenses and has in recent years embraced the comparison with the porcupine. Weaker than its aggressor, but capable of inflicting huge losses. A Center for Strategic International Studies war game exercise in January 23 posited the most likely, quote, base scenario would be a Chinese bombardment and invasion, which founders. We'll add many practical caveats to that at the end of the video. But the point for now is that the tiny island of Taiwan at least stands a chance to repel China for a critical window of time, destroying amphibious invasion vehicles and killing countless soldiers. Taiwan has an outsized economy and outsized defenses for its population and geographic size. So how did it get so strong. The fear that China will invade Taiwan is ever-present and has only intensified as Russia's invasion of Ukraine ushered in an era of uncertainty and rapid militarization in the Indo-Pacific. As Germany's foreign minister put it, a unilateral change in the region, especially military, would be unacceptable. That's diplomatic speak for China, don't invade Taiwan, please. <laughs> What's unclear is what the Western response would be. Even the US keeps strategic uncertainty when it comes to how it would respond should China invade Taiwan. President Biden explicitly said on multiple occasions that the US would come directly to Taiwan's aid, but this was always immediately walked back by administration officials. That's actually the point, keep China guessing. Who knows what the USA would actually do? But naturally, Taiwan isn't waiting around to find out what the West would do, economic sanctions, direct military intervention. If the invasion of Ukraine is the model, then Taiwan might expect arms aid and sanctions on China. But one big difference between Ukraine and Taiwan is that Taiwan can be far more easily encircled, besieged, precluding arms deliveries like those passed through Ukraine's western border during its invasion. In fact, China has practiced encirclement of Taiwan with three days of quote, large-scale air and sea exercises in April 2023. While I was working on this video, China sent over 100 planes to probe Taiwan's air defense identification zone. In short, Taiwan might need a solo plan for doomsday. And that's probably why Taiwan recently added to defenses. A potential $620 million sale was announced by the US Pentagon, which would include F-16 jet missiles and missiles that can, quote, take out land-based radar stations. They've been working to convert 141 A and B type F-16s into F-16Vs. Overall, the plan is to increase defense spending by over 10% compared to the previous year for a total of nearly $20 billion. They're fortifying. But the bottom line is Taiwan really needs other countries' help. Biggest example, Taiwan is, no surprise, heavily reliant on the US for weapons, and they're currently waiting on about $20 billion in backlogged arms deliveries. $20 billion in equipment like F-16Vs and Harpoon anti-ship missiles. So today, the stakes are high, and Taiwan seems relatively strong. But this is a history channel. What can history, both recent and distant, tell us about how Taiwan got so strong, and important Importantly, how far does that strength really go? And are there any historical parallels we can responsibly make? Bonus at the end of this video, is Taiwan's strength a bit of a bluff? A lot of people pose the question, is Taiwan part of China? Perhaps there is a better question, is Taiwan part of Japan? Stick with me here. After the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894 between China's Qing Dynasty and Japan, the surgeon Japanese had eyes for many Qing possessions, including Taiwan. The war demonstrated the weakness of the Qing, which was forced to sue for peace in 1895. And in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, China's Qing Dynasty ceded Taiwan to Japan. And so Taiwan remained a colony of Japan until the end of World War II in 1945. 50 years. Taiwan briefly spent an interim period as an integrated part of mainland China before becoming an isolated island following the Chinese Civil War, a status which remains today. So in the past century and change, Taiwan spent 50 years as part of Japan's empire, 75-ish years as a quasi-independent island, and only four years as part of mainland China. In recent history, Taiwan has spent more time as part of colonial Japan than as a recognized part of China. This portrayal is intentionally loaded just to show that the situation is not as straightforward as the Chinese government would have us believe. And don't panic, Taiwanese viewers, I'm not suggesting that Japan invade Taiwan instead of China. I'm simply illustrating that, as it turns out, Taiwan's history is not just one of China, 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 what China's president called, quote, common inheritance of blood language history and culture. There are other powers, the shifting Taiwan 
Taiwanese population itself, twists and turns, issues of colonialism, war, democracy. It's a history worth telling. Chinese records reference Taiwan beginning in the 3rd century BCE. That's when the first Chinese expedition of Taiwan was sent by an emperor, returning with the conclusion it wasn't of much value. First outsiders to have a goat controlling all of Taiwan were the Dutch, specifically the Dutch East India Company, who constructed a fortification on the island in 1630. In 1644, the collapse of the Ming Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty on the Chinese mainland sent refugees over the Taiwan Strait. They displaced the Dutch, establishing mainland originated Chinese control over Taiwan for the first time. Ming control of Taiwan lasted 20 years until 1683 when the Qing Dynasty finally left the mainland and conquered Taiwan from the Ming. Taiwan was then an integrated part of mainland China. And to date, the Qing rule over Taiwan was longer than any other power that had or would come to control the island over 200 uninterrupted years. This is the basis for the current Chinese government's claim to Taiwan. There's this expression I learned uh, working for Germans in the last couple of years, es kann keine zwei Meinungen geben. It roughly translates to, uh, there can't be two opinions on this. That's basically where the government in Beijing stands. We had Taiwan for two centuries, mid 1600s to late 1800s, therefore it's ours. There can't be two opinions on this, God forbid more than two opinions. But it ain't so simple. Look at these pictures. This one was labeled around the turn of the 20th century. It's a Taiwanese woman looking, to use very technical language, Chinese. This image fits well in China's portrayal of Taiwan, shared heritage, history, but here is an image from a similar time, slightly lower photo quality, hope you can see it okay. It's labeled as two Aboriginal Taiwanese people, and as you probably see, they're not dressed, again, to use technical terms, Chinese, they appear to me as Japanese in dress. An image like this challenges the idea that Taiwan's history is straightforwardly Chinese history. It challenges us to see difficult subtleties. It may seem strange to us today because we associate Taiwan as being off the coast of mainland China, but of course Japan isn't far off either. Taiwan is southwest of Japan. Just above Taiwan lies Yanaguni Island, one of Japan's most southern islands, far closer than the 600 mile away Japanese mainland. Japanese control began with the suppression of Taiwanese resistance to their rule and continued to be harsh thereafter. Foreign governors sent from Japan forced Taiwanese people to speak Japanese, take Japanese names, and wear Japanese clothes. During wartime, Taiwanese men were sent to fight and die. Taiwanese women were sexually exploited by Japanese soldiers. Through forced integration, the Taiwanese were subservient colonists. They were never considered equal to the Japanese. There is some subtlety to the situation. Economic development came under the Japanese. Agricultural exports were expanded with new farming practices and subsidies. The colonizers brought education reform, banking, taxed previously untaxed land for use in expanded postal, energy, and road infrastructure. The colonizers invested in public health, disease treatments, hospitals, a medical university. See Murray Rubinstein's Taiwan A New History listed in the description for a good breakdown. Five decades of colonial Japanese rule came to an end, again after World War II, in August of 1945. In August of 1945, Japan's unconditional surrender went into effect. Taiwan was ceded back to mainland China, officially under control of Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China as of October 1945. Taiwan had changed dramatically after 50 years of Japanese rule. When mainland Chinese control was reinstated, the Taiwanese in many ways resembled the Japanese colonizers more than their Chinese liberators. Stephen Phillips put it well, quote, both Taiwan and mainland China had changed so much between 1895 and 1945 politically, socially, and economically that the retrocession was less of the restoration of historical ties than the attempt to forge an entirely new relationship. Taiwan's history had diverged from mainland China and reintegrated, there was chafing. I don't think it's controversial to say that Taiwan was ahead of the mainland in several ways in 1945, especially economically. And Republic of China governance under Chiang Kai-shek was corrupt and neglectful, even spilling into violence when the Taiwanese protested. But here's some irony. This match made in hell was about to become permanent. Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China control over the mainland was not stable at all. In fact, after World War II, China was embroiled in a civil war between Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China and the communist forces of Mao Zedong. In the four years following the end of World War II, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists lost ground to Mao. By the end of 1948, over 30,000 refugees from the mainland were arriving in Taiwan. Taiwan every single day. Mao controlled both Beijing and Nanking, and so finally, in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek retreated from mainland China to, of course, Taiwan just as the Ming Dynasty had fled the Qing centuries before. Here's the difference. The Republic of China government that would flee to Taiwan would continue to claim itself as the true government of all of China. Chiang Kai-shek had a large benefactor, the United States, the China seat on the UN Security Council, and total grip on Taiwan. Despite existing to contrast the communist government in Beijing, the government in Taiwan was not a democracy. It was one-man rule under Chiang Kai-shek. Dissidents were not allowed 
One day, it was pledged, one day the true government of all of China would take back all of China. And just to make sure Mao didn't come across and put down this uh, endeavor prematurely, President Truman moved naval vessels into the Taiwan Strait in 1950. So confident was he that the Republican government was ready to retake mainland China. This situation became the status quo. Chiang Kai-shek would rule Taiwan under the pretense that he would retake mainland China. And of course, Mao's mainland China desired reintegrating Taiwan. And so the situation stayed with tweaks for decades. President Nixon normalized relations with mainland China in 1971 and supported them as they took the seat on the UN Security Council from the Republic of China, aka Taiwan. So diplomacy changed. And so did Taiwan's government. A democracy movement changed Taiwan starting in the late 1970s and through the 1980s. The seed of a pluralistic Taiwan far more recognizable to us today was planted then. So it is fair to say in terms of time, as in years, Taiwan's history intersects most with mainland China's history, at least from the third century BC onwards. But through the Dutch, through the Japanese, through quasi-independence, it's clearly a distinct place. As I said in my full video on Taiwanese history, there is China and there is Taiwan. It borders on circular truism, I know, and yet it's not something mainland China's government would recognize. But let's be topical for a second. Elon Musk got himself into trouble in September 2023 when he puppeted China's talking points. I think I understand China well. I've been there many times. I've met with uh, the senior leadership um, uh, at many levels in China for, for many years. From this standpoint, it, you know, maybe it's analogous to like Hawaii or, or something like that. Like an integral part of China that is arbitrarily not part of China. Arbitrarily? This parroted point of view of history is just inaccurate. You could say Taiwan has deep and difficult ties to mainland China. You can say it has deep and difficult ties to Japan, deep and difficult history as a semi-independent island. What you can't say is that the separation, literally or figuratively, is arbitrary. Hell, even the example Musk gave, Hawaii, demonstrates the falseness. Hawaii was independent, annexed by the US. Plenty of taken places have regained independence through history. If Hawaii somehow became independent again, you could call it a big deal, but not arbitrary, not historically arbitrary. No. Okay, briefly, what can history tell us about how Taiwan, beyond the minutiae of its identity, how did Taiwan get so strong? Number one, money. Taiwanese independence in the last 75-ish years has seen the development of a large and affluent economy relative to geographic size and population. More or less in line with the period of democratization, Taiwan's economy took off in the 1960s, blasting off through industrialization and export growth for decades, slowed only occasionally by recessions in the 90s and 2000s. The move to knowledge work and industrial exports heralded a shift that is known as Taiwan's economic miracle. See this article from Brookings on some important subtleties on Taiwan's economy because it's not all rosy. Nonetheless, today Taiwan is the 16th largest economy on earth, despite being nowhere near the 16th largest geographically. The part of Taiwan's economy continually driving growth is the communication technology sector. And that's strength number two. Taiwan leads in chip manufacturing for smart devices, computers, and cars. Taiwanese chips are so in demand that governments are involving themselves to directly ensure their continued access to these chips. For example, the German government recently announced they would contribute up to 5 billion euros for a Taiwanese firm to build chips in a factory in Dresden. Modern devices need Taiwanese chips, and therefore modern economies need Taiwan. Leverage like this gives Taiwan strength. It's cynical to say, but one of the big reasons Western countries are so adamant that China not invade Taiwan is not just the desire to retain an Asian democracy, but the fear of losing friendly access to this modern necessity. Resource leverage imbues indirect strength. The prosperity that flows from it allows for more direct strength. Thus, number three, Taiwan is relatively strong because it buys lots and lots of military equipment. We spoke about how Truman moved vessels into the Taiwan Strait in 1950. Bill Clinton sent aircraft carriers in the Strait of Taiwan in 1996 to deter mainland missile provocations, and the U.S. still has a huge presence in the region. The U.S. shadowing hasn't made Taiwan strong, but it has played enough defensive interference to give Taiwan a chance to buy what it needs. Arms sales increased during the Obama and Trump years. As we know, it continued in the Biden years despite some logistical setbacks. And that, in a nutshell, is how Taiwan got, let's say, physically strong. It developed into a large economy with valuable, bordering on invaluable resources. It spends tax dollars from this major economy on mountains and mountains of arms, sheltered in the meantime by a powerful ally, the US. In this way, Taiwan is like a power lifter with a small frame, huge muscles, despite a constrained bone structure. My imaginary producer is telling me that comparison is obnoxious, but 
it's gonna help me make my next point, so I'm keeping it. Because real strength is not mere physical capability to pick up the heavy thing in the gym and put it down. Well-rounded athletes generally need explosiveness, flexibility, stamina. These also make up true strength. In the same vein, piling up a bunch of arms on Taiwan is not enough for true strength. If invasion comes, is there capability for a well-rounded response, one with quick, explosiveness, flexibility, stamina to repel the invasion. That brings me to the last way Taiwan got so strong. Taiwan's defense plans are based on strength, yes, but asymmetric strength. That is, accepting that they are at a natural disadvantage against the might of the Chinese military in terms of numbers and money, but realizing the defensive war could be waged through naturally difficult mountainous geography and asymmetric warfare. This is gamed annually through Taiwan's Hong Kong military exercise, and it's all detailed in Taiwan's ODC, Overall Defense Concept, an acronym I first encountered in this rundown from The Diplomat. That same explainer, published in 2020, show the disparities between Taiwan's military and China's military that you would expect. So how can Taiwan capitalize on the asymmetry? A general idea from the US government is to turn Taiwan's defense into that of a porcupine, quote, bristling with weapons that would inflict severe pain if attacked. As I was researching this, the porcupine metaphor showed up so much. Think Tank articles and other publications too. And it makes sense. China is the big predator and Taiwan is the wily defender. This article from Michael O'Hanlon fleshes out the concept, quote, Taiwan may be able to fend off an outright Chinese invasion invasion attempt with a porcupine defense, featuring sea mines, anti-ship missiles launched from shore batteries and helicopters, and concentrated resistance wherever China tries to come ashore. If China attempted a simple blockade of Taiwan, perhaps buttressed with bombing, it's likely Taiwan would not quickly capitulate, and thus the US could become involved, thus creating deadlock. Therefore, the most likely Chinese strategy would be a full-scale invasion right away to prevent any slowdown or standstill. Previously, that strategy was expected to manifest as an invasion of Taiwan-controlled islands near China and near Taiwan's western coast, the coast facing mainland China, a heavily populated coast. As part of the porcupine tactics, Taiwan would be ready with ways to slow this direct assault by meeting the Chinese on the beach, but also by thinning numbers before such landing through anti-ship missiles, sea mines, and anti-aircraft equipment. Quote, the essence of Taiwan's conventional capabilities is a low quantity of high quality platforms. While the specifics of such planning is not public knowledge, expectations have been that this initial defense in the West is expected only to slow not to stop a Chinese invasion. Taiwanese forces would retreat east, holding the mountainous regions of Taiwan and the eastern coast through guerrilla tactics. The idea would be to buy enough time for US reinforcement to arrive. And as we saw at the start of the video, when CSIS gamed this out, Taiwan repelled China in their most likely scenario. Now, this was at great cost to themselves and allies, but with success. Hey. It all seems pretty planned out. Taiwan is strong in arms and strong in strategy. And nimble strategy was the last piece of the puzzle on how Taiwan got so strong. Case closed. Or is it so elementary, my dear Data? There is a huge assumption here. The assumption being, in the case of Chinese invasion, the US will directly intervene, will go to war and defend Taiwan, will in all likelihood lose ships, planes, lives. Perhaps Japan would join in too and join in on the losses. All that's a possibility, not a guarantee. The US has a policy of strategic ambiguity. The president goes out and says, if China invades, we'll intervene with our own military to defend Taiwan. But then the message is walked back. Maybe we'll send our own, maybe we won't. The logic of the US policy is intended to, one, discourage China. They don't want a war with the US, but also, and importantly, to discourage Taiwan from being too openly confrontational with China. And that's achieved through ambiguity because there's no guarantee the US will show up if Taiwan somehow provokes war on itself by formally declaring independence from China for example. So ambiguity is meant to encourage behavior in US interests from both China and Taiwan. And if US help is no guarantee, might Taiwan's strength be a bit of a bluff? When China launched war exercises in April 2023, its aims were to demonstrate it could surround and encircle Taiwan. From the New York Times, a research fellow associated with Taiwan's defense ministry said the exercise was to show that China can do it on our east coast as well as our west coast. During the drills, quote, Chinese fighter jets practiced taking off from the aircraft carrier Shandong off the east coast of Taiwan. Other ships maneuvered in the seas around Taiwan. An elite Chinese war exercise, which I found via Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Lots of emphasis on China 
Chinese military resources during a conflict to not only the Strait of Taiwan, between China and Taiwan, but the South China Sea as well, which extends to Taiwan South. In short, there's no saying the war would go down like expected, with the Chinese only deploying resources to Taiwan's west. So we've talked about strength and planning thus far in a narrow situation, one in which China invades from the west and Taiwan holds out until help can arrive from the east. But all these exercises and leaked documents undermine Taiwan's plan to wait for US help in the east. Taiwan isn't likely to hold out like Ukraine, sending out refugees and bringing in arms from less besieged portions of the country. Taiwan is too small. Its encirclement would need to be broken by outside forces. That's a huge weakness if the US and or Japan don't intervene. And here's another twist. What if our expectations of Chinese behavior are even more wrong? Invade from the west? Invade from the east? Invade from all sides? Everything assumes full-on on rapid invasion attempts because a half-hearted war would still result in severe Chinese losses. So might as well go for it, right? But this paragraph from John Culver stuck out to me in all the analysis I encountered, so I'm gonna quote it directly. Many in Washington believe that if Beijing resorts to the use of force, the only military option it would consider is invasion. This is a dangerous oversimplification. China has many options to increase pressure on Taiwan, including military options, short of invasion. Limited campaigns to seize Taiwan-held islands just off China's coast, blockades of Taiwan's ports, and economic quarantines to choke off the island's trade. Does Taiwan have the strength to thwart an indirect strategy, one short of invasion. What I think I'm trying to ask here is, does Taiwan have the strength to wait and wait, cut off from the world? We now know how Taiwan got so strong, but how strong is so strong? And I gotta admit, I don't know. And this is a history channel. We dip from the present to the past to the present where we are now. But now, I gotta whip out the old Uno reverse card. We gotta go back in history, baby. So yeah, it was at uh, this point that I started to look for historical parallels. Taiwan has its own interest, but it's pulled here and there by two large powers, China and the US. Where have we seen situations like this before with a small place caught between two large powers? If we could find a similar circumstance from history, we could learn from it. We have so many cliches as a society when it comes to analyzing the past for current events. You'll see someone use lazy sayings like, history repeats itself, and perhaps a clever responder will say, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Or the crazy one will say, no, history goes in circles. And then pretentious metacritics like me will come along and respond with near nihilistic fervor. You know, technically every situation is unique, and so therefore you can't really make comparisons with the current day and the past. But you know what? I'm not gonna leave us in this purgatory. I'm gonna posit a historical parallel, despite the pitfalls, and I'm warning you ahead of time, there is no perfect straight historical line to be drawn. This is just for fun and with any luck, food for thought. And I invite you to let me know in the comments if I'm full of it. I'm almost embarrassed by how pretentious this is, but my imaginary producer is off smoking a cigarette, so it's just between you and me. When I was writing this video script about Taiwan, I kept thinking about this dialogue in Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. Now, the first thing to know about Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War is that it was written in the 5th century BCE and described a war between the Athenian Empire plus allies and the Peloponnesian League led by Sparta. Here's a helpful map from Wikipedia, the greatest work of intellectual altruism in human history. Thucydides also spent a long time describing events leading to the war, which is what I will draw from. Second thing to know, this is really early in the history profession. Herodotus was the so-called father of history, and I have a whole video on him, and next was Thucydides. So Thucydides is helping to create the craft of history, and therefore his work has quirk. Which brings me to thing to know number three about Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. The dialogue I'm gonna quote from here is probably invented by Thucydides, or at least paraphrased. Well, <laughs> what? I mean, this does not mean we should disregard Thucydides, but we have to take his speeches with a bit of a grain of salt, even as we draw lessons from them. Get on with it, you say. Okay, when learning about Taiwan's situation stuck between mainland China and the United States, I thought of Corsaira, a neutral city-state stuck between Athens and Sparta. At this time in the 5th century BC, Athens was building up its empire, in practice connecting its league of city-states called the Delian League. That's partly because it expected a war with a rival power, Sparta, which had a league too, the Peloponnesian League, and thus the name of the war that broke out between Athens and Sparta the Peloponnesian War. But before the Athens versus Sparta War started, a smaller and neutral city-state, Corsaira, was in need of help. And though Corsaira was neutral, 
Corinth was not. Corinth was allied with Sparta's Peloponnesian League. And when Corsaira repelled the naval attack from Corinth, Corinth went looking for material help from its Peloponnesian League allies so it could attack Corsaira again. With Corinth pulling aid from allies, Corsaira knew it was in trouble if it stayed neutral. So Corsaira decided it needed an ally. And if your enemy was Corinth and Sparta's Peloponnesian League, then the natural power to turn to was Athens and the Delian League. So Corsaira sent an embassy to Athens to plead with the Athenian assembly to approve an alliance. And Thucydides gives us a flavor of the speeches the Corsairian delegation gave in Athens, quote, We Corsaira, seeing our utter inability to cope with Corinth without foreign aid and the magnitude of the danger which subjection to them implies, find it necessary to ask help from you, Athens. The Corsairians also mentioned that they had a strong navy and the Athenians had a big navy. So if they were to become allies, those strong and big navies could work together against wink wink nudge nudge those spartans and their peloponnesian league not that war is coming or anything between athens and sparta now the athenians did in fact feel that war with sparta was coming so having corsaira's navy around would be nice and lord knows if they didn't agree that very corsairian navy might even end up conquered by an ally of sparta end up allied against athens in a war no good so the athenians were tempted by alliance with Corsaira. Now, Athens didn't agree to a full alliance, but they did agree to a defensive pact. That is to say, Athens would come to Corsaira's aid if Corsaira were attacked. And indeed, not long after agreeing this defensive pact, Athens sent 10 ships to Corsaira with instructions. Come to Corsaira's aid if Corsaira were attacked. And lo and behold, Corinth attacked Corsaira once again. And this time, the 10 Athenian ships were there. When Corsaira's naval flank encountered problems, the 10 Athenian ships jumped in the fray. The Hackers retreated. Corsaira was safe for now. However, Athens' intervention and many subsequent incidents, were told, would eventually lead to the breakout of the Peloponnesian War, would eventually bring catastrophe to the ancient Greek world. Taiwan, like Corsaira, is stuck between major powers. Sparta, Athens, China, USA. Taiwan, like Corsaira, appeals to one power's interest. That is to say, Athens needed Corsaira for what she could provide. The US needs a safe Taiwan, not really because Taiwan's a democracy and shares democratic values, but mostly because Taiwan has resources and location. It's in American interest. It's transactional. And therefore, issues of justice are lost. What's right, what's best for Taiwan is far down the list after microchips, Chinese pride, Indo-Pacific power politics. Taiwan can only scavenge her interest after the others have picked her clean. That's not a great place to be. That's not a strong place to be. Corsaira was relatively strong given her size. She could hold her own against Corinth initially, but against the combined resources of the Peloponnesian League, Corsaira knew she had, quote, utter inability to cope without foreign aid. Taiwan is relatively strong given her size. She could hold her own against China initially, but eventually Taiwan would be utterly unable to cope without foreign aid. It reminds me of another dialogue in Thucydides when Athens told a lesser power, you understand as well as we do that in the human sphere, judgments about justice are relevant only between those with an equal power to enforce it, and that the possibilities are defined by what the strong do and the weak accept. What the strong do and the weak accept. Justice relevant only between those with equal power to enforce it. The only powers equal to impose their view of justice are the US and China. Taiwan, despite relative strength, is small in the grand scheme, is weak when stacked between China and the US. Therefore, her fate is for the strong, the truly strong, to decide and for her to accept. I find China, its history, its present, so freaking interesting. So I'm always looking for new ways to read, watch, and learn more about it. And if you watch this video, you might be like me. That's why I think you'd like Polly Matters series, China Actually on Nebula, an exploration of how one of the world's most consequential countries really works. You'll get a perspective on the two Chinas, the one presented to the world by Beijing and the one lived by 1.4 billion Chinese people. On Nebula, you can also watch all of my videos, ad-free and before they go live on YouTube. In fact, you might leave YouTube behind for a while and browse series and creators like Extra History, Johnny Harris, Jetlag, JJ McCullough, who I'm really excited to see on our platform, Lots of creators are posting content on Nebula first. If you've followed me for a while on YouTube, you know I've struggled at times to keep up with YouTube algorithms treadmill, which wants constant content all the time. 
You know, to be fully transparent, I bore the consequences of taking much needed breaks, worth it as those breaks were. Nebula is another way for you to support me and my work, a place for you to watch sharp content and help this little project in the process. Nebula is a creator-owned and operated streaming service, home to quality content made without the pressure to serve the YouTube algorithm. So you can find new and unique series, Nebula originals like Modern Conflict by Real Life Lore, City Beautiful's Great Cities, which shares the biggest moments in the greatest cities on Earth, or Windows the logistics of X. If you sign up using my link below, you support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes with 40% off annual plans. $30 a year, like $2.50 a month. There's so much on the platform. It's great value. But at this time of the year, we're also thinking about gifts for the thoughtful folks in our lives. And this holiday season, Nebula is offering lifetime memberships. Lifetime for $300. Pay once and get Nebula for as long as both you and Nebula exist. Speaking of pulling back the curtain, the idea here is growth for Nebula. We're splashing on shiny new series for the new year. Some great series like China Actually and Modern Conflicts are already there. And lifetime memberships fuel, let's just be blunt, raise capital for cool new content like this. $300 for yourself or a loved one this holiday season. Never see Nebula on your monthly subscription list again. It's just there no tomfoolery, a straightforward lifetime membership. It helps us, supports me, and brings you a lot of value. I will always have free content for you on YouTube, but I do kindly ask you to click the link below. Take a look at Nebula. Later, y'all.